Hello, and welcome to Food for You and the Planet, a fresh new podcast that explores healthy and environmentally sustainable food solutions. This podcast is brought to you by Healthy Plan Eat Online Farmers Market. I'm Dr. Rosemary Ostfeld, and I'm your host. Together, we'll hear from leaders in environmental science, agriculture, medicine, nutrition, entrepreneurship, and more. Be sure to hit the subscribe button to hear all the latest in healthy and sustainable food with food for you and the planet. Today's episode features Alexis Andaman, Senior Attorney at Earth Justice. Alexis is a senior attorney with the Sustainable Food and Farming Program based in New York. Prior to joining Earth Justice, Alexis completed fellowships with the Conservation Law Center at Indiana University and the Center for Biological Diversity. She received her JD with honors and a certificate in environmental and natural resources law from Lewis and Clark Law School. While in school, Alexis worked as a legal writing teaching assistant and intern with a variety of environmental and conservation organizations, including Columbia Riverkeeper, Advocates for the West, and the Earthrise Law Center. Thank you for being here today, Alexis. Oh, thanks so much, Rosemary. Great. So let's start off um, just by learning a little bit about Earth Justice. So what is Earth Justice and what type of work does it do? Well, Earth Justice is a nonprofit public interest environmental law organization. We work to protect people's health, preserve magnificent places and wildlife, advance clean energy, and combat climate change. We like to say that we are here because the earth needs a good lawyer. Earth Justice always works on behalf of and in partnership with clients, including both well-known national environmental groups and grassroots and community organizations. In 2023, we represented 570 clients across the country, and we always represent all of our clients free of charge. Um, what are some of the sustainable food and farming issues Earth Justice is working on right now? We have a really broad mandate. So we focus on reducing pollution from industrial agriculture and accelerating the shift to a climate-friendly food system that supports farmers and workers and neighbors and consumers. Um, I'm sure you and your listeners know that our current food system is a major source of air and water pollution. Air pollution from industrial agriculture contributes to thousands of premature deaths every year, and water pollution from industrial agriculture threatens drinking water and contributes to dead zones in iconic water bodies across the country, including Chesapeake Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. Agriculture also threatens our climate. And even though our current food system produces a lot, many people lack easy access to affordable, healthy food. Um, so the bad news is <laughs> industrial agriculture causes a lot of harm. And it's also largely exempt from regulation under major environmental laws like the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. And federal subsidies often incentivize polluting practices. The good news is we know that farmers can produce healthful food without seriously threatening their workers or their neighbors or consumers. So we need to find ways to shift towards healthy and climate friendly farming practices. And that's what our program really focuses on doing. We fight in court and engage in administrative advocacy and also sometimes help to support legislation that drives that shift towards the methods of production we want to see while also helping to curb some of the worst instances of pollution. So how does Earth Justice work with scientists and local people on these issues? Is it something that, um, you know, your legal team uh, reaches out to people as they're trying to do this advocacy work? Like, what does the engagement process look like? It's really a mix. Um, as I mentioned, we always work on behalf of clients and partnership is really essential to our work. Um, Sometimes it happens that a community organization is aware of a problem and looking for help, and so they reach out to us, sometimes with a clear idea of what they want to do, and sometimes just with a sense that there's a problem and they need tools to address it. Um, 
And sometimes we are focused on an issue and reach out to people to see if our perception is correct, that, that this really is a problem for them, and if so, work together to come up with a solution. So there's really a mix. Um, but the huge benefit of working in partnership with clients is that we're able to learn from people who have direct personal experience of the issues that we're talking about. So when we're working on pesticides, we're typically talking to farm workers and farm worker advocates. And when we're, when we're working on industrial animal agriculture, as I mentioned, we're talking to people who live in areas where those facilities are really densely concentrated. So we're lucky to be able to rely on our clients and get their help to inform our work to make sure our facts are correct um, and that we're understanding the issues properly. Um, going back to the topic of pesticides, what are some of the key victories Earth Justice has helped achieve um, related to pesticides? Well, Earth Justice attorneys have a really long history of working to prevent harm from the most dangerous pesticides. And that includes pesticides that we know to cause cancer and that we know to cause reproductive and developmental problems in humans and wildlife. Um, I can highlight a few of our recent successes. Um, Together with a coalition of farmers and health professionals and environmental groups, we worked last year to support the Birds and Bees Protection Act in New York State, uh, which the New York governor recently signed into law. And that act will limit the use of neonicotinoid pesticides, also known as neonics, which is a little easier to pronounce, including non-agricultural lawn and garden uses. Um, uses on golf courses, and also neonic coated corn, so soybean, and wheat seeds, which research shows actually don't offer any economic benefits to farmers and also cause a lot of ecological harm. Um, actually, EPA has said that neonics are driving more than 200 species toward extinction. So, this New York law is a really big deal and we're really excited to see it go into effect. Um, another recent example, a few of my colleagues uh, were recently successful in challenging EPA's registration of streptomycin, which is a medically important antibiotic that was being used as a pesticide to prevent citrus screening. And among other things, uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, which ruled on that case, found that EPA failed to comply with the Endangered Species Act in approving streptomycin as a pesticide, failed to fully consider the risks that streptomycin poses to honeybees, and also failed to establish that streptomycin works at all to prevent citrus screening. Um, so that was a really important opportunity to both preserve the efficacy of antibiotics and also prevent risks to workers and the environment from a pesticide. Yeah, I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize is that uh, organizations like the Environmental Protection Agency can actually be held liable um, if they aren't acting in accordance uh, with some of these policies. I think people don't really realize that they can actually be perhaps like the, almost like the target for some of these uh, lawsuits. It's really interesting. Um, yeah, absolutely. EPA does so much good work. And also, you know, they need to be held accountable, just like every other government agency to make sure that they're complying with the laws and keeping people safe. Something I've heard um, some small farmers talk about is, you know, there's the organic certification where uh, they have to do all the diligent reporting. And, um, you know, do large corporations that are uh, spraying pesticides that are harmful, do they have to um, document all of the pesticides like that they're using over time and disclose that information to consumers? I kind of feel like I know the answer to this question, but yeah, like what are their um, documentation and reporting um, requirements? Well, transparency about pesticide use can be a really tricky issue and it can vary a lot by state. We're actually doing some work now with some pesticide use advocates who are trying to increase state level transparency so that folks are able to access more information about what's being sprayed in their communities and what the risks of exposure that they face might be. But 
the short answer is there are a lot of barriers to getting that information and most states don't have laws that allow people to access it easily. You know, another really big issue aside from pesticides um, is the pollution that is from slaughterhouses. So what are some of the key victories Earth Justice has helped achieve related to slaughterhouse pollution? I know this is an issue that you guys have worked really hard to fight. Yeah, this is something we've put a lot of time into over the years. And as a result of our litigation, which we worked on with co-counsel at an organization called the Environmental Integrity Project and also a number of community and environmental organization partners. Uh, EPA recently committed to revising its water pollution control standards for slaughterhouses and rendering facilities. On average, more than 17,000 animals are killed every minute in slaughterhouses across the country. And slaughterhouses typically send their byproducts, things like fat, bone, feathers, and blood to rendering facilities for conversion into tallow and lard and animal meal and a bunch of other product, products. Um, both slaughterhouses and rendering facilities require a near constant flow of water to carry out their operations. And as a result, they discharge huge amounts of dangerous and damaging water pollution. Among other things, slaughterhouses and rendering facilities are leading sources of nitrogen and phosphorus pollution, which can render water unsafe for drinking, unfit for recreation, and uninhabitable for aquatic life. Um, for example, exposure to some nitrogen compounds in drinking water can cause colorectal cancer, thyroid disease, birth defects, and in infants, a potentially fatal condition known as blue baby syndrome. According to EPA, more than 60 million people live near rivers and streams that are degraded by pollution from slaughterhouses and rendering facilities. And EPA admits that most of those people are people of color and people with low incomes. So the Clean Water Act requires EPA to set water pollution control standards for industries, including the slaughterhouse and rendering facility industry, review those standards every year and revise them as necessary to ensure that the standards have kept pace with improvements in pollution control technology, which is getting better all of the time. For slaughterhouses and rendering facilities, EPA published standards in the mid-1970s, about 50 years ago. But those standards only applied to a subset of facilities. And then 20 years ago, EPA updated its standards for an even smaller subset of facilities. So most facilities, many facilities are subject to standards promulgated in the 1970s, and obviously technology has improved a lot since then. Um, and the existing standards are not just out of date, they're also really inadequate in other ways. So because EPA has been working on this subset by subset approach, only about 3% of slaughterhouses and rendering facilities across the country are subject to national water pollution control standards at all which means that 97% of facilities are not subject to federal standards. And there's really not enough oversight into what they're putting out into the environment. What are some of the key victories Earth Justice has helped achieve related to farm worker safety? Well, so as I mentioned, a lot of our pesticide work is driven by concerns about farm worker safety. Um, Hundreds of thousands of farm workers suffer pesticide poisonings every year. Acute poisonings can result in rashes, vomiting, and even death. And over time, chronic exposure to pesticides is associated with increased risk of certain cancers, infertility, neurological disorders, and respiratory conditions. Um, we've done a number of We've worked on a number of issues related to farm worker health and safety over the years, uh, but one recent example is the work we did to strengthen and defend a really important federal safeguard for workers, which is known as the Agricultural Worker Protection Standard. And among other things, the Worker Protection Standard helps to ensure that there's high quality pesticide safety training available to workers um, and that workers who are under the age of 
18 are not mixing, loading, or applying pesticides unless they're working at an establishment that's owned or operated by a family member. Um, the worker protection standard also includes an application zone requirement, which we call the AEZ requirement, designed to reduce exposure to pesticides among farm workers and bystanders. And essentially, the AEZ says that if you're spraying pesticides and someone unexpected comes into an area where they might be sprayed, you should stop application <laughs> so that you don't accidentally expose that person. Um, we recently helped to stop a rule that would have rolled back the AEZ requirement. And we expect a new rule protecting the AEZ to come out sometime in the summer. Do you think that you're going to start to see more and more examples of people taking action against pesticide companies? I remember the Dwayne Johnson case uh, a handful of years back about Roundup. Um, it seems like it's starting to you know, create a, a waterfall of different cases. Do you think that it's going to be more common people will take action? We'll see. I think as, you know, as people learn more about risks and some of the consequences of exposure to pesticides, we may see people feeling a bit more concerned and wondering about whether they've been exposed and looking for help. What sustainable food and farming issues are you most passionate about addressing right now through your work? Like, what are you excited about and uh, where do you think you can uh, spark a lot of change? I, during my time at Earth Justice, I've had the opportunity to work on a number of issues related to industrial animal agriculture, as I mentioned, um, beginning back in uh, I joined in 2016, but I began working on a federal civil rights complaint that we filed in, in 2014 concerning North Carolina's oversight of concentrated animal feeding operations, which people call CAFOs, as I mentioned. Um, that work has been really meaningful to me over the years, in part because I've had the opportunity to partner with some really inspiring folks, including the people at REACH, who I mentioned. Um, who've really taught me so much about standing up for what's right. Um, so that, that work has been a real privilege and it's ongoing. We're currently working on um, ensuring that people living near CAFOs and CAFO workers have access to information about dangerous air pollution that those facilities put out. Uh, there's a federal law which is a bit of a mouthful, known as the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act, or EPCRA, which essentially provide, requires that facilities that produce extremely hazardous substances, including ammonia and hydrogen sulfide, have to report uh, unpermitted emissions of those substances to state, tribal, or local authorities. And those authorities, in turn, make information about the reports available to the public. So EPCRA's a really important law because when you're able to access this information, you can make decisions about your health, talk to your doctor, um, decide how much time you want you you know you want to spend out time yourself or or whether you're comfortable with your family members spending time outdoors, um, and you can advocate for stronger protections if you know what you're being exposed to on a regular basis. Sometimes mandated reporting induces polluters to reduce their emissions voluntarily just because once people know what those facilities are putting out, there begins to be a little bit of a stigma and facilities decide it's worth investing in reducing their pollution. But for almost 20 years, EPA has exempted CAFOs and APHOs, which are slightly smaller, but not small animal feeding operations from reporting under EPGRA, which means that people who live near these facilities who are experiencing the consequences of exposure to ammonia and hydrogen sulfide, things like watery eyes and scratchy throat, vomiting in some cases, in some cases even death, can't get information about what they're breathing. So we're in court fighting to eliminate EPA's exemption and 
on a somewhat separate track, EPA has begun a new rulemaking process or is contemplating beginning a new rulemaking process as part of which it might decide to eliminate its exemption. So that's work that I'm passionate about right now. I think exposure to you know access to that information is so, so important. Um, and it's really troubling to see the desire to keep these emissions secret from the people who are directly harmed by them. Yeah, so are there any actions that regular people can take to try to mandate this reporting? Um, and then a follow up to that is, what are some of the resources that people can explore to see if they may currently be exposed to um, things like, you know, pesticides or other uh, impacts from slaughterhouses and our agriculture system? Well, on the first point, EPA is currently accepting comments from the public about whether it should rescind this exemption um, of EFCA reporting for CAFOs. And if people want to, they can submit comments to EPA. The comment period is open until March 25th. And How do people there's... access that? Like, where do they go to um, submit a public comment? You can submit public comments at a government website, regulations.gov, by searching for the rule that you're interested in. And I can give you a link, Rosemary, if that's an easier way to get it out to, to people. Um, on the second point, you know, getting information can be really hard, especially when you're dealing with industrial animal agriculture or industrial agriculture in general, because there are so many exemptions from bedrock environmental laws, which means that there's not always permitting, which tends to be a good way to get information about facilities in your area. We have some maps on our website um, that we've created using information from the EPA and other government agencies. We've been able to map locations of slaughterhouses and rendering facilities and map locations of CAFOs in some areas across the country. And there are other organizations that have done wonderful mapping work, including the Socially Responsible Agriculture Project and Environmental Working Group and Waterkeeper. Um, so maps can be out there if you're willing to look, but it's harder than it should be. And that's something we're working to change. If people were to visit your website, are there any kind of hotspot locations where there are more of these types of facilities? Like, are there certain areas in the north, south, east, or west where there's kind of like a collection of more CAFOs? Well, CAFOs exist across the country, um, but I'm sure it won't be a surprise to your listeners that CAFOs tend to concentrate in environmental justice communities in areas where there are higher numbers of people of color, higher numbers of low-income people. Um, so we see concentrations of CAFOs in Southeast North Carolina, which is historically in area with a higher percentage of people of color. There are a lot of CAFOs in the Central Valley in California where there's a large Hispanic population. And even in places like Iowa, um, there's a huge number of CAFOs that tend to be located near children and older folks and people who live in rural areas where they're not as easily able to get healthcare if they start experiencing symptoms as a result of exposure to pollution or even have access to a gym where they can go exercise indoors if they no longer feel safe walking outside. Um, so I guess the answer is these facilities are all over. There might well be one near you and certain people are especially at risk. So I have one more question. What actions can people take to advocate for sustainable food and farming? There are so many. An important step is voting, learning about candidates, getting involved in all levels of government, understanding what the people who represent you are saying and fighting for and working for and supporting. That's crucial. Um, personal actions are so, so important. And a huge theme in our work is that it shouldn't be an individual responsibility to make sure that the food you're buying 
doesn't con contain carcinogenic additives and didn't make the people who produced it sick or put them at risk of injury or illness. That's what the government is there for. So it's wonderful to do things yourself. And it's important to, to really take note of what the people who represent you are doing. Um, and I think it's also so valuable to just think about your food choices and talk about your food choices. There are so many things that go into making decisions about food and it can be so personal and cultural and so important in so many ways. I think when you start thinking about your food choices, you learn firsthand about the barriers and challenges that exist, you know, how hard it can be to get information about where your food is coming from or how it was produced. Um, and as you learn those things, you you start to figure out what it is that need to be changed and that prepares you to be an effective advocate. Thank you so much, Alexis, for joining today. Um, and thank you for fighting for people and our planet. Thanks for the invitation, Rosemary. This was fun.